So the time now is two o'clock. I think we can start our uh, webinar. Okay, yes. so hello everyone. Hi, uh, very, very warm welcome to all of you, friends and colleagues to Home Nursing Foundation second CME series on the functional rehabilitation for frail elders in the community. As you all know, Home Nursing Foundation have been serving frail and needy homebound patients for the past 46 years by providing home health care services such as home therapy and home medical, as well as home nursing. We have also opened two senior care centers, Wellness at Haogang and Wellness at Wangkok, to serve the needs of frail elders in the community with the aim to improve their function and overall health. And this year, with the leadership of Dr. Ng Wai Chong, our prolific medical advisor, we have the privilege of organizing a series of continuing professional education as we embark on this journey to improve the holistic care and also empower our patients to live joyfully. So we have just completed a series on end-of-life care for frail elders in the community setting. And the YouTube videos are available on the QR code link that we sent um, with this publicity. We also warmly welcome you to attend our first physical interdisciplinary care conference that will be held on 11 November. So we will be launching our care path on end of life care for frail elders and be able to hear from renowned speakers such as Dr. Diane Myers and local experts such as Dr. Angel Lee, who will be sharing their experiences and perspectives with a group of interdisciplinary uh, professionals in palliative care. So this afternoon, we are very privileged and honored to have Dr. Kong and Mr. Simon Lau, who will be sharing their knowledge with us on stroke rehab. Very, very grateful to you, Dr. Kong, and also Mr. Lau for spending your afternoon with us. Without further ado, I'll pass the time to Dr. Ng, who will be introducing them and moderating today's uh, webinar. Thanks, Christina. So that's our CEO, HNF. Uh, I'm uh, Wai Chong. I'm the medical advisor. I'm very happy and honored to be um, working with uh, um, <coughs> Home Nursing Foundation on this series of webinar. So, um, and a lot of um, thanks to uh, uh, also to uh, Dr. Lo Yongju, who is the head of um, Tan Tho Sing Rehab uh, Department. And uh, with his support, we have got eminent speaker like uh, Dr. Kong King He and uh, Mr. Simon Lau. So um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kong. Um, Dr. Kong is currently the senior consultant rehab physician in the Department of Rehab Medicine in Tan Tong Sing Hospital, as well as an adjunct associate professor of the Yongle Ling School of Medicine, NUS. He's also the chairman of the Residence Advisory Committee on Rehab Medicine Training in the uh, Ministry of Health. His interest is in neural rehabilitation, and in particular, the area of stroke rehab and plasticity. He has more than 22, 72 publications in peer-reviewed journals and is the editor of the Handbook of Rehab Medicine. I understand that uh, we have got two parts to today's uh, sharing. So after Dr. Kong, uh, I will be introducing uh, Mr. Simon and then uh, Simon will be sharing with us um, uh, uh, his, um, his expert uh, expertise in physiotherapy, but I'll be introducing him after Dr. Kong's sharing. So Dr. Dr. Kong, please. Okay, I'll start sharing my screen. Yeah. Can you all see my screen? Good. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, yes. Christina. Good afternoon, Wai Chong. Hi. I. I, I think. Uh, <laughs> It's great that there are people willing to listen to us talk on a Saturday afternoon with the better things to do. <laughs> so, it's so, a huge turnout yeah. and we're very grateful that you're willing to <laughs> yeah, so spend I'm more grateful time for the tenders than anything else, actually. Yeah. Uh, um, so, um, it's true, we have this a very big topic, you know, and, and given just about 20, 25 minutes to talk, I, I think it will not do justice to the, to the talk itself. But I'll try to focus on um, problems or um, issues that uh, our practitioners, whether it's doctors and healthcare, commonly face when you see the patients out in the community, either in the day rehab centers or when they're receiving home based rehabilitation. So, I, I'm going to keep my talk predominantly to uh, commonly face stroke rehab complications. And I've decided to target these four problems 
shoulder subluxation, hemiplegic shoulder pain, spasticity, and mood disorders, because all these four disorders are common disorders, and often I get asked by patients or the carers on, um, on their management as well as prognosis, as well as mechanisms and manage and, and what to do with them. Okay. So the first problem to talk about is that of shoulder subluxation. Yeah. So 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 this is a very common problem, as you can see here. Um, if you look at this picture here, you know, if I were to ask you to guess which is the sublux side, can you tell me? Shoulder stabilization simply means that shoulder is slowly, is mildly dislocated out of position. You know, so if, if you look at this, this, this picture means I'm so clear, but you can see that the there is a slight droop in the shoulder here. There's a gap here as opposed to the left shoulder. So clinically, there's obviously a sublux shoulder right side. This one is a right hemiparesis. Yeah, and you can diagnose shoulder subluxation clinically by filling for a gap between the acromion and then the the humeral head. Yeah, so here there's a gap. You can measure clinically whether the gap itself is half a finger breath, one finger breath, or two finger breaths. Of course, the more it is, greater the severity. Sometimes we can see, we do x-rays, can see the shoulder being out of position. All right, so this is a common problem and, and, and uh, at least I would say half of patients with a stroke would have some degree of shoulder subluxation. A question often asked is, do you need to x-ray the shoulder to diagnose shoulder subluxation? The answer is really not necessary. If you can diagnose shoulder subluxation clinically and the patient has no other concerns like you're concerned about a fracture and things like that, then there's no indication to do shoulder subluxation. A clinical diagnosis will suffice. Why do they get shoulder subluxation? Uh, the answer is pretty obvious, you know. Our shoulder itself is shoulder joint is a very shallow joint, and it is held in place predominantly by a rotator calf, especially the supraspinatus, as well as the posterior deltoid muscle. And if normal motor power, these uh, this these muscles actively keep our shoulder in place. After a stroke with hemiparesis, the more severe the hemiparesis, these muscles lose the activity and the shoulder will droop and become sublux. So it's really a function of how severe your your stroke severity is the greater the stroke severity, the greater motor impairment, the greater the degree of shoulder subluxation. What, why is it of concern itself? First of all, it can be associated with shoulder pain, but a lot of shoulder patients with shoulder subluxation do not have shoulder pain, but they can have shoulder pain. And the pain is because you're slightly that when the shoulder subluxes, you can stretch on a shoulder capsule, which is very pain sensitive. So that's one cause. And sometimes, Patients and patient caregivers may be concerned that prolonged subluxation, if not treated, may affect motor recovery of upper limb. Is this really the case? Um, well, potentially, when the shoulder droops itself, it can stretch on the brachial plexus around the area and, 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 and affect the nerves. But that is truly, really, really uncommon. I, I, we are not very sure that it can affect motor recovery. Yeah. Can it get worse over time if you don't treat early? You know, uh, Normally, it should get better because after a stroke, most patients improve unless uh, it's, it's a matter of extent of recovery. But sometimes they can worsen because of poor handling of the patient. So, for example, you know, in acute stroke itself, if a stroke in a patient may be, you know, may consciousness be low and have a hemiplegic arm itself, you know, they may transfer the patient, you know, injury transfer itself, they may, they may have poor shoulder care, they may pull on the shoulder, and then it, that, may, that may aggravate their shoulder subluxation, right? So, so this is one cause, and even, even in the a, in a subacute current stage, it is still good sense to provide proper shoulder handling. Uh, Simon will talk about, a bit more about proper care of the hemiplegic shoulder later on itself. Okay. Is there any treatment to, to, for proper, to treat shoulder subluxation? That means, can we make it better? Can we reduce, reduce the shoulder you know, and, and prevent it? Um, the evidence says that electrical stimulation of the shoulder muscles, essentially the supraspinatus and portion deltoid, Acutely within four to six weeks may have some effect in reducing the subluxation, but if the patient is three months to six months, it probably does not make any difference at all. Yeah, so in electrical stimulation, we apply electrical stimulation over the supraspinatus as well as the posterior deltoid. Uh, and so this is usually done acutely. By the time you see them back in the community, this uh, form of treatment itself is probably not effective. This is a very common question asked by patients, you know. So, so do we need to support the shoulder with a sling? Yeah, so that it doesn't get worse. Uh, if you look in the market itself, there are many, many forms of shoulder slings and harnesses that purports to reduce the subluxation. This is one of those a shoulder harness. It is 
uh, whereby you got to wear across the shoulder. And so it's uh, very, very hard to don this shoulder harness itself. And this is a simple shoulder sling. And the truth of the matter is, the evidence so far suggests that whatever you apply to the shoulder, whether it's a complex shoulder harness or simple shoulder sling, none of these slings actually can reduce shoulder subluxation effectively. All right. In my practice, I, I normally don't prescribe these complex slings. I would just ask the patient to put on a shoulder, a shoulder sling, a simple shoulder sling costing less than $20. Not so much to reduce the shoulder subluxation, but probably in acute stage to warn people that, hey, you know, I have some problem with shoulder, please handle me with care. Yeah. Some patients who don't have to complain of a heavy weight of the limb when they walk, the fact that my hand is heavy, it's drooping and things like that. And that's when we may ask them to put on a shoulder sling and if, if they feel better, it's not so tight, then they can put on, they can use the shoulder sling whenever they stand or they walk. All right, but shoulder sling has its own problems also because if you don't have spasticity, you know, especially with the adductor and elbow flexor spasticity, the wearing of shoulder sling can theoretically worsen that spasticity. Yeah, so my, my, my advice is, Use it if you think it's helpful. If you don't, don't bother. The treatment is really to, to prevent further worsening. If there's pain, we treat the pain accordingly. Yeah, that shoulder subluxation. The second problem, which uh, really troubles a lot of patients, that have a hemiplegic shoulder pain. Yeah, the prevalence is anywhere from 16 to 72%. You know? and, and this is one of those whereby it can affect, affect the patient's function. For example, if it's pain, they cannot participate in their rehab exercises. Sometimes when they sleep at night, they can't turn to the affected side because it's painful and the pain may affect their sleep as well. And sometimes uh, they are not able to dress upwardly because of the pain. So pain in permanent shoulder pain is a very, very complex issue. As opposed to normal people, a lot of times you can say, hey, this is a, a, the main cause here. For example, a rotator cuff, we can treat that very, 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 uh, a very isolated patient and get good treatment. But in a, in a stroke patient, the multifactorial causes, all right? So, so the cause include that includes that adhesive capsulitis. I mean, a common term we used to describe this frozen shoulder. Why is it frozen? You know, if you have a stroke, your shoulders, your muscles are weak, you can't move the joint. Even if you go to rehab, you just move up an hour a day. And the prolonged immobility can cause your shoulder capsule to contract and become frozen. Yeah, so when you move the joint, it becomes very painful. So it's a function of, again, motor weakness as well as immobility. And of course, you get rotator cuff tendinitis. So you can see the picture itself. You know, as you try to A, B, dart the shoulder itself, you know, normally uh, we'll do the cuff to hold the shoulder head nicely against, to, against the, the humeral joint and avoid the acromion itself so that we don't rub against it, All right? But if you have shoulder weakness, especially rotator cuff, the rotator cuff is not able to put this properly into the, into the glenoid joint when you do A, B, dart shoulder. Instead, it rubs against the acr acromion. You know, as each time you A, B, dart itself, you rub against the acromion. So initially, you don't get pain, but over time, you get a lot of inflammation and patients start to complain of pain. So that is also very common because as a patient attempts to exercise to improve the strength of upper limb, there is a mechanical disadvantage that my mechanical alignment is not correct and they get pain. So that's, that's where the PT comes to the place to try to get them to move the joint in a biomechanical normal way. A lot of re-education needs to be done and a lot of retraining needs to be done. You can get bispiritual tendinitis and you also can have spastic muscle spastic, especially if a trolley major. This one can pull the shoulder into adduction and worsen subluxation and causes pain, right? Uh, not uncommon complication is that of complex regional pain syndrome. This is a new term for old terms like shoulder hand syndrome, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, whereby what you get is you love shoulder pain. In addition to that, you have signs of dysautonomia, whereby you get swelling, hand swelling, especially fingers, the digits, and you also get color changes and edema. And, and, that when it, and the hand may become warm. So when you see such cases, you think of complex regional pain syndrome and the treatment is quite different. So in terms of management, of course, even though it's multifactorial, it'd be good to find out if there's a predominant cause for the pain, all right? If the shoulder subluxation is a cause, then we try to avoid further stretching, or shoulder sling may help to alleviate the pain. Check the patient's range of motion. If the range of motion is limiting all directions, there is a capsular pattern, then it suggests adhesive capsulitis. If the pain is predominantly at, in the abduction, you know, for example, a painful heart syndrome, it suggests rotator cuff or subacromial impingement syndrome. Right? If there's temperature change, this coloration, swelling, then think of complex regional pain syndrome. We'll start with analgesics first. Uh, they, 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 they would probably be quite useful for most patients. I particularly find that uh, intra-articulate steroid injections are quite useful for those with, for example, refractory adhesive capsulitis after two to three months, so shoulder stiff, 
And despite medications, they cannot move. And because they can't move, you can't stretch shoulder, you cannot arrange them and the shoulder becomes, it doesn't get better. And that's why intraarticular steroid injections, either into the glenohumeral joint or into the subacromial region can be quite useful. And it's effective, can last for three to four months. Normally, we don't need repeat injections for these group patients because once you cut out the pain and the patient is able to range the shoulder, the range gets better, the pain goes down. The challenge is always trying to minimize the pain so that patients can move on and continue with the rehab program. For complex regional pain syndrome, a course of oral steroids is very useful, sometimes for two to four weeks. I give prednisolone about 30 milligrams of two weeks. It's also useful for adsips capsulitis, and a lot of time after giving steroids itself, you find that the hand swelling, the warm goes down. And sometimes if you tail down, they may be recurrence pain, you can push the steroids back up. You can give up with four to six weeks, so usually very, very good outcome. For those with spastic muscles, may only consider bottom toxin injections. I'll talk about that later. And then appropriate range of motion exercises. I mean, I, I think uh, the first thing to avoid is, is to avoid overhead pulley exercises. You know, this is this causes tremendous damage to the shoulder joint, especially when the shoulder cannot move in a biomechanically normal range of motion. Yeah. I always tell my patients to move within pain-free range. Yeah. Uh, the thing with shoulder pain is sometimes acutely you don't see them, you know, because sometimes acutely they have either sensory loss or neglect, so they don't feel the pain. It's only about three to four months, four months down the road when the neglect gets better, the sensory improvement improves, just to do that, that's when they start to complain of pain. Yeah, so, so you may see a lot of patients like that. Post-stroke spasticity, uh, this is a big topic. Uh, see a lot in chronic cases, you know, the prevalence varies in the chronic stage. If you see a lot of Patients with, uh, with with degree of hemiparesis, the prevalence could be around 50 to 70%. You know, uh, as you look at this picture here, uh, there are specific patterns of spasticity after a stroke. You find that the upper limb would be the shoulder would be adducted, that means close to the chest. The elbow, the wrist and fingers would be flexed. The knee will be extended and the ankle will be plantar flex or inverted. We call that the equinal varus deformity. So this is the typical and maybe the posture that we see in a lot of patients. And of course, we all know this, this very well, the complications of post spasticity. You know, you have increases of contractures. Look at this lady. She, she's a lady who was 65 years old, who had a severe subaronic hemorrhage, you know, and she was, uh, she, was, uh, um, she was comatose when she was discharged to a nursing home. By the time she got a nursing home, one year later, she woke up, but she has a lot of contractures and spasticity. You can see that she has spastic contractures of a knee flexor as well as hip ductus. For the upper limb, you have the elbow and elbow flexors and the wrist and finger flexors. The nurses in the nursing home, two nurses have to spend time trying to care for a perennial, perennial hygiene, change your diapers. Each time change diapers, you need nurses to change. So there's a lot of demand on, on manpower as well. Therapies trying to provide rehab would take a lot of time and effort to do so. Yeah. So this is some of the complications. There's increased risk of contractures. It affects function, it affects nursing care affects the ability to participate in rehab as well. Of course, for those with gait problems, it affects mobility as well. Yeah. This is the foot of a hemiplegic shoulder pain, a pain patient, of a, of a patient with a post stroke spasticity. She has a equino varus gait and walks with an inverted gait. And you can see the big callus. <laughs> because she says she walks, she lands a lateral aspect of the foot and there's a callus here. So these are known complications. Of course, with equino varus gait, the gait is unstable. There's increased risk of falls as well. Management-wise, uh, I think cornerstone is still a lot of stretching, a lot of uh, range of motion. Uh, unfortunately, this is the hardest part for patients to, or carers to do when they go back to the community because you do indeed need to spend a lot of time. And sometimes the patient himself or herself cannot do it on their own and needs a full-time carer. And need to do one or two hours of stretching every day. So over time, patients tend to get tired of it and probably don't do a lot. So the emphasis of stretching is really, really important. Splints, we provide splints sometimes. For example, if, they, if you have a wrist and finger flexor spasticity, we can give the resting forearm splint. Okay, normally put two hours, two hours on, two hours off. And then for those with an equinal varus gait, sometimes we give them an ankle foot orthosis to improve their, uh, their walking pattern. Medication-wise, uh, I think baclofen is probably the commonest medicine we use amongst doctors. Uh, um, start on 5 milligram TDS. I, I'm not a big fan of baclofen in stroke patients because a lot of stroke patients have concomitant cognitive problems. You know, their gait may not be good. So baclofen can cause giddiness, drowsiness, can also weaken strong muscles. But um, uh, um, if you need to give 
this medicine in low doses and titrate and watch for side effects. The other class of medication is benzodiazepines. Of course, they're stronger than baclofen. Uh, so because of the psycho, psychological and physical dependence, as well as the sedative side effect, it is not used a lot. I only use benzodiazepines as a nighttime dose, either diazepam or clonazepam, normally clonazepam for patients who have a lot of spasms of the lower limbs, upper limbs during sleep as a result of spasticity. So nighttime dose of clonazepam 0.5 to 1 mg may be useful just to treat the spasms so that it can sleep better. Then trillium sodium is a medicine that acts on muscles. We don't use a lot here, so I will not talk about it. Yeah. So we do a lot of chemo denivation. We, we can define this as a technique in which we, we, a pharmacological agent is used to weaken a muscle or groups of muscles. And, and we have two ways of doing so. First is to the use of botulinum toxin injection. I think you're familiar with Botox. Second is to use of nerve block with neurolytic agent. We still do a fair bit of that here. So what does Botox do? Actually, Botox induces a, a blockage of the neuromuscular junction. You know? So you, your, there's, uh, your neuromus neuromuscular junction essentially does not conduct impulses. So there's essentially paralysis of the muscles and does this by inhibiting release of acetylcholine. It is a very, very safe treatment. Uh, uh, sometimes patients uh, hear that it can cause a lot of weakness. It's not true. Okay? It all depends on the dose we give and the doses we give are usually therapeutic range. Uh, severe weakness as well as Botox is extremely, extremely common. I must emphasize it's extremely safe treatment itself, and the side effects are really minimal. Uh, the average duration is about two to three months. Uh, it doesn't mean that a patient needs repeat injections. Uh, if you do this early on after the stroke, there is a good chance that you may not need repeat injections. All right. And cost consideration, in the past, it was very, very expensive. I think uh, under MOH now, there are subvention programs for people with post-stroke spastic whereby they subvent the cost of one toxin. And so the price has gone down quite a lot, actually. It is easy to do, it's very safe, and it is effective. Nerve blocks, uh, in case, this case here, nerve blocks, we, we essentially would try to damage the nerve cell with sort of to say, using a agent. Here we use ether alcohol. This is the same alcohol we have in beer, vodka, or your multi. The range comes from 50 to 100%. What it does is when you inject into the nerve, it, it causes damage to the myelin axonal axons, and so the nerve cannot conduct impulses and hence the muscles become paralyzed. All right. A uh, side effect is if, if you if you neuralize a mixed nerve, you know, a MERS, for example, median ulnar nerve, there's potential that apart from uh, from, from affecting the motor fibers, you also affect the sensory fibers, and there's a chance that you may get some form of this is just your neuropathic pain. Yeah. Duration, three to six months up to one. It depends on concentration of alcohol use, depends on how good you are, how close you are to the nerve neuralize. It is definitely more effective than potent toxin, and cost wise is much, much cheaper. It probably costs $100 to do a simple nerve block, and, and I thought call is extremely cheap. This is the nerves we neuralize a fair bit in, in my patients, the musculoclutinous nerve, because these, these two nerves are predominant motor nerves, so you don't get a lot of side effects of neuropathic pain. So I, I, this musculoclutinous supplies the elbow flexor, so it's very good for elbow flexor specifically if the patient does kind of afford both talks. So if you think that you, know, the, you think that you want to do less frequent injections, so this is good. For, for the lower limb, uh, the obturator nerve is the one whereby we would neuralize for patients with hip adductor spasticity, like the patients I showed a lot uh, previously. It's very effective. Of course, the alternative is to do bottom toxin to the hip adductors, but it's going to be much more costly. And for the tibial nerve, this is the one that causes the quantum variscate. We neuralize uh, for that as well, although there's a small risk of neuropathic pain. So, so for this one, I'm, I'm pretty open to either one of those. Uh, a lot of time now, I just give bottom toxin. All right, I'll show you some video, all right? Uh, this video is a man of uh, a taxi driver who has a stroke with left hemiparesis. Look at his gait itself. So you'll find that uh, there is a uh, plantar flexion gait, see? He's got ankle plantar flexor spastic. See the hips, he cannot have, his heels are, are, are plantar flex. He has no heel strike, right? He lands on his uh, forefoot. And that's his main problem here with his gait. Uh, plantar flexor spasticity. Yeah, so this is a very simple case of just botoxing the, the ankle plantar flexors, and this is what you get uh, three months later, uh, about six weeks later. Look at that. You can see that the foot is now very nice, plantar flex. All right.
And that's interesting for this, this man is that all they needed was just one injection. After the injection, they corrected the plantar flexion and with continued walking, is able to sustain that, ang that, that reduction in plantar flexion and, and that's all we need to do for him. Yeah. Uh, next, here is a man. Uh, this is an elderly man with a stroke. He has a equinovarus deformity. Okay, this is he's 80 plus, you know, uh, and he needs two people to get a stand up, you can see, to foot place as well. The helper is trying to place his foot properly. <laughs> yeah, they're trying to get the weight bear on the left lower limb, yeah. So you find that the helper needs to initiate swing for him and consistently have to position his foot. There is equinovarus, that means ankle plantar flexion, it's just ankle inversion. He lands on the lateral aspect of the foot itself. Yeah. Okay, and his gait is very slow. I did a tibial nerve block for him to block the gastroc as well as the tibialis posture muscle. And this is a gait four weeks later. See, he can swing now on his own because there's less plantar flexion. He's got much better foot placement. More importantly, he needs a new person to walk him. So, so cutting down the various deformity can decrease the level of care needed for him, improve stability gait as well. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's a big change for him. You see that, right? Uh, I will not show you this slide. I think uh, I will skip this slide. This is a slide of like hip plant, hip adaptive spasticity. I will not show you that itself. Yeah, so the, I think the last problem we talk about is post depression. I think, uh, I think most of, most of us are probably aware of this issue, but sometimes we still may not treat them accordingly. Uh, if you look at stroke patients anywhere from point of the stroke, any time you sample a population stroke patient from after stroke, one month, one year, three years, five years, each time they do a cross-section survey, one third of patients will have symptoms of depression. Yeah. It goes to show that even if depressed now, we treat them one or two years later, their risk of depression is still there. Right. And we know clearly that patients who are depressed have worse functional outcome. Even mild depression has been shown consistent to affect the quality of life. Means even mild depression needs to be treated. All right. And predicts of depression, the patient has prehistory of psychiatric illness, as well as severity of stroke and dis disability. These patients are high risk of depression. The treatment doesn't always have to be pharmacological because, you know, it's always counseling, psychotherapy. Have, this is important. But sometimes, you know, you know, psychotherapy and counseling is very labor-intensive. It takes a lot of time, all right? So a lot of time, my threshold of treating such patients is actually pharmacological treatment. And, and the, the, the newer generation of pharmacology agents like the SSRIs are very, very safe. Yeah. So uh, we would normally give them uh, antidepressants at least for three to six months for those we have evidence depression. And even if they do get better, we'll continue to monitor, monitor them because sometimes after reducing depression, they do recur. Yeah. Some patients may complain of post emotional ability. That means they find that sometimes they, come up, they cry easily, even without any trigger, you know. And for less group patients, they may laugh. Some may swing from crying to laughing. Crying easily doesn't mean that you have depression because certain stroke, especially those involved in the brainstem or the stress bilateral, can cause emotional ability. Does it need to be treated? No, but some of these patients find that the inability to suppress the crime can make them, uh, can, can, can affect them socially. They, they dare not go out, they dare not go and see friends because they cry so easily with little triggers. Though. And we know that this can be treated with, again, with uh, specific antidepressants like the SSRIs, and they'd be quite useful. Yeah, so, so just to take a note that, that just because uh, they're not depressed doesn't mean that they don't respond, they don't need certain, uh, certain antidepressants for certain treatment as well. Okay. I think uh, I've come to the yeah, last time. So, 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 so uh, thank you for listening. Uh, I, I hope I don't have covered everything itself. So I've purposely reserved some time to, to, to answer questions because I'm sure you have more to ask than what I've just, what I've just said. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, King He. So uh, we shall listen to um, the, our senior physiotherapist from Tantok Singh, Mr. Simon Lau, before our Q&A session. So let me just do a quick introduction. 
So Simon is um, works in Tanto Singh Rehab Center, has 11 years of clinical experience in rehabilitation, currently specializing in neurological condition in stroke um, in inpatient setting. And uh, he has uh, led significant um, various programs, uh, particularly um, in stroke rehabilitation, such as the stroke upper limb circuit training and the walking skills laboratory. So, um, so maybe let's hear from Simon and then we will have some time for Q&A. Simon, please. Hello, yeah, thanks for inviting me and thanks for the call for your talk. Let me share screen. Yeah, okay, so, um, so today, yeah, uh, uh, I'm going to share uh, some physiotherapy management for people with stroke. Yeah, after the inpatient rehab, yeah. So objective is to um get you guys to highlight the importance of the further rehab at home. Yeah, after the inpatient setting. Yeah, be it home therapy or when um when the when you guys see um the stroke patient in the LC. Yeah. So also um to be provide some overview on some uh some form of rehab uh interventions following the inpatient rehab. Lastly, I will talk about some considerations for we have when we are seeing patients at home. So first of all, some um, background for stroke in Singapore. Yeah, so um, stroke is itself, uh, the seventh leading cause of disability. Yeah, on average, about 26 stroke cases every day. Yeah, and um, a lot of research showing that um, more than 50% or even 63% of stroke patients will have disability after three months. Yeah, as our Singapore populations age, yeah, so the um, burden of care of stroke will just getting higher and higher. Um, as we all know, yeah, stroke uh, in fact, um, not only uh, impact the physical functioning, um, it also affect our cognitions, affect our uh, set, uh, sensations, uh, speech and swallowing, yeah, and um, also um, mood and uh, depression disorder as well. So more than 34% of stroke survivors will report some limitations uh, after, uh, I mean in ADLs at six months, yeah, even after um, uh, rehabilitations. That's why it's important for every one of us here to uh, continue our rehab uh, even after their uh, inpatient state. Some, uh, some facts about the recovery after stroke. Yeah, so as we all know, peak neurological recovery um, normally occurs within first three months after stroke. Um, it will continue, at, but at a slower pace. Yeah, in the following months, maybe um six to twelve months down the road, they will still improve, but in a, a much uh small uh lower rate. And um, functional outcome is uh hugely depend uh dependent on the initial severity of stroke. Yeah, so um if the mild um uh, initial severity after stroke, yeah, the rehab outcome is definitely better than those um severe severity at the initial stage. And bear in mind that there are a lot of research evidence showing that um, after they go home, yeah, I mean, uh, three to five years down the road, th there will be functional decline in, AD in ADL and mobility. Yeah, so uh, the reason being is that uh, in inpatient, they, re they receive, um, I mean, high intensity rehab. Yeah, one, once they go back to community, maybe the intensity is uh, a bit lesser and then they don't really manage well themselves. So, yeah, so uh, that's very often that we see in our patients, yeah, we see a lot of functional declines in terms of the functional mobility and ADLs, which is why um, we need to know how to maintain and then to um, further progress the uh, functional outcome. Principle of stroke rehab, yeah, so first, um, task specific. Specific. Yeah, so when we uh when we do exercise for stroke patients, we have to task specific, need to be targeted and re relevant to patient needs. For example, um functional some functional exercise, walking, stairs, curbs, yeah, or some even ideal exercise, dressing, toileting. And then the exercise we deliver has to be intensive. Yeah, so high high intensity of practice will stimulate the learning and promote the motor learning. And it needs to be um uh, high repetitions, yeah, high repetitions stimulates the learning and improvement as well. And more importantly, our exercise needs to be challenging to our patients. Yeah, so um, when we increase the difficulty of the exercise gradually, you enhance the task performance we would like to achieve for our patients. Overall, yeah, it will promote the neuroplasticity and for the restorations of our patients' function. 
um, when we um, when we see our patients yeah, at home uh, at home or doing inpatient setting, there are different uh, I mean there are different they come with different severity or different type of stroke patients. Some may be backbound, some may be with backbound wheelchair bound, some may be um, assisted walker or some may be um, better than assisted walker, maybe they have already achieved some form of walking. So here is important to highlight uh, what are the objectives or the aims when we see um, these uh, different types of patients, I mean, at home or in our, uh, in our center or in other community settings. So, so um, for those backbound or wheelchair-bound patients, objectives, yeah, so, um, aim to optimize functions, for example, to continue the uh, sitting and standing uh, regime or standing tolerance. And then some, sometimes uh, maybe um, has already um, completed the CGT on the carrier in terms of the fibrocute ambulations. Yeah, so at home, yeah, so we should continue to uh, do that. Uh, more importantly, we need to build up the acti activity routine for this type of patients. Yeah, literally to build up a time scheduling for, for patients because they are uh, quite dependent and then rely on a lot of, uh, a lot of care. Activity scheduling, for example, um, in the morning, yeah, maybe um, um, breakfast, followed by exercise, maybe uh, going out, yeah, while the wheelchair, and then afternoon exercise, and so forth and so forth, is to build up the routine and then to normalize their daily life. More importantly, yeah, for this sort of patient, they're prone to a lot of secondary complications. Yeah, so for example, uh, hemorrhage shoulder pain or uh, spasticity and contracture, as Dr. Kong mentioned before. Yeah, so uh, we need to know or we need to teach the family as well as the carer how to prevent this sort of complication for um, this sort of patients. When we see other, when we see other type of patients, um, at home, yeah. So um, they may be able to walk, but need a lot, need a bit of assistance. Yeah. So objective may be different for this group of patients. Yeah. So this group of patient is um, require a lot of contextualized training into their home environment, as you can see in the pictures in our normal uh, Singapore HDB. Yeah, a lot of obstacle for them to conquer in order to achieve some form of independence in mobility. For example, curb stairs yeah if they are not if they're staying on new landing home or sometimes uh, even curb and stairs to um uh, conquer or negotiate as well yeah so um when when they are in the form of assist uh, assisted uh, walking so we really need to um i mean tailor our uh, interventions um in their home environment or home setting so uh, I would encourage everyone to um, try um, aim for um, to train those kind of functional tasks like um, curb stairs and then also stairs, yeah, and then to with the aim of achieving the homebound ambulations independent. Lastly, yeah, when we see a patients, when we see a patients, they are, have they have already walking around quite uh, fairly well quite independently at home. So what we would like to achieve, yeah, the main aim for this population is to reintegrate them into the community. Yeah, so in, in level in flat survey or the, uh, in flat survey like HDB home, or maybe they are able to conquer the home obstacle curb and stairs. Now is the time for them to continue to progress in the community. So they need to, um, they need to cross the traffic line. Yeah, they need to be able to, um, um, go in and out of the public transport like bus or MRT escalator, and then they need to be able to manage the crowded environment like hawker centers, market. Yeah, so uh, it's the time for uh, the therapists to train into these aspects yeah, for them to build up the walking endurance, yeah, the speeds, yeah, um, the ch further challenge, the balance. And then um, also, not only the physically, also need to see whether they're able to manage yeah, in a crowded amount around them or able to manage uh, money, man money management when they want to buy food or whether they're able to communicate yeah, with the hawkers or uh, those sellers yeah, in terms of uh, uh, daily, uh, daily stuff. So now I will um, uh, move on to um, talk about some, uh, some considerations while we deliver the rehabilitations. 
first I will talk about goal settings. Yeah, secondly, I will talk about um, preventions of the secondary complications. When we deliver exercise or de uh, deliver um, interventions to our patient, we really need to set goals with our patients very clearly. So here we normally use a uh, SMART goal. Yeah, need to be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Yeah, so uh, it really promotes the patient centeredness between patient's care, carer and the therapist itself. Yeah, because every every patient or every um, I mean every client has different needs or different uh, goals in their mind. Yeah, so at the same time when we set the goal um uh, with the patients, it uh, really enhances patients' motivations, and then it also help the therapist itself to um um to really specify what kind of exercise training. Uh, really needed for the patients. And ultimately, it's kind of strengthen the communication between a uh, healthcare professional and the patients themselves. So here are some examples. So this lady is stroke patients. Yeah, so what, what, what she wants to do is to uh, do a wonton. I mean, the Chinese, uh, Chinese wonton. Yeah, but before doing that, yeah, we need to set the goals with them. Yeah, because uh, there's a lot of ingredients and stuff. The hand dexterity is not uh, well established yet. So before we do that, yeah, we actually, um, I mean, um, tailor some home exercise instead of cutting meats and stuff. Yeah, so we get the ladies to cut the bread. Yeah, and then to um to roll to to roll the bread into um I mean a a ball. Yeah, to um at the same time, not only practicing yeah um uh, the opening uh, functions, but also uh, is tailored to their goals. Secondly, this lady work in um I mean work in orchard yeah as a uh, department store, ladies yeah so every day he need to travel around MRT and then need to walk a distance um to work yeah so um one of the aims for her uh, is to return to work. Yeah, so um, the therapist uh, will uh, will need to bring the patients to do the come outing to see to the actual um, uh, working uh, route, take MLT and then public transport to uh, to really train this lady to be independent in the community before going back to work. Um, now uh, I will touch on to the prevention of the secondary complications, um, namely hemiplegic shoulder pain, and as well as spasticity and contracture. Um, um, a lot of research papers showing that thirty to sixty-five percent of stroke survivors re uh, report the shoulder pain, and once the patient has shoulder pain, yeah, so they um. um they tend to protect the joint and avoid the pain. Yeah, I mean during the opening, uh, opening intervention, opening activity. Yeah, during rehab or when they're at home, actually it kind of uh influencing their recovery. Yeah, and also personal care. Yeah, and issues. Yeah, so um, if we can imagine if they are in pain, yeah, it's also they they cannot really perform um their daily tasks. Yeah, using the upper name is also associated with um, reduced quality of life yeah, overall. So management of um, the hemiplegic shoulder pain yeah, as a healthcare, pro healthcare professional, um, more importantly for therapies is um, education. Yeah, education is uh, very important to, um, um, to prevent or to manage the health, uh, I mean the shoulder pain um, to the patients. Uh, to the uh, caregiver as well as the family member to really get them to aware how to look after the shoulder yeah, before, um, I mean, before the stage that they get the shoulder pain. So um, here I will touch on, uh, on our, how, how, do we, uh, how do we manage uh, or prevent the shoulder pain in our daily life in uh, handling, positioning, and support. So uh, um, this this some pictures to illustrate, yeah, to uh for the positioning when they're in different positions. Yeah, so um they need to be, I mean, um the um so they need to be uh, well supported, the hemiplegic shoulder arm, yeah. So need to be well supported, need to be balanced, yeah, and then um when they are lying on uh um supine or in sitting positions, yeah, and then also in side lying to protect the shoulder joint, yeah. 
So for example, in, uh, in Supai, we will encourage the carer or a family member to stop in the PO to, well, uh, to support uh, the shoulder joint rather than um, um, compressing the shoulder joint. In sitting, uh, we will do uh, the same principle. In sitting up on the chair, we will encourage the uh, family member to uh, put uh, the neck tray yeah, or to put some appeal yeah, under the shoulder to prevent the, um, um, the effect of the gravity yeah, pulling, uh, pulling the shoulder down, especially for those uh, patients with um, facet shoulder. Same principle in um, side lying. Yeah, so try to avoid uh, compressing on the shoulder joint yeah, when we uh, lie on the side. So instead of maybe uh, instead of like full side lying, yeah, we will encourage maybe quarter quarter side lying or just uh, side lying maybe one third. Yeah, to avoid the compression of the shoulder. We also um we also will encourage the patients and family member to uh. Um, to have a shoulder sling, yeah. So there are uh, many, many types of shoulder, shoulder sling in the market. As Dr. Kong mentioned before, the company is on the left-hand side, it's uh, just a Mueller arm sling. Yeah, so uh, it's well supported, yeah. So um, it's when normally we, uh, we will uh, teach the family member uh, or uh, patients how to dog on and down off, and then only we'll use when they are in standing, when they're walking. Yeah, or they are uh, in seeking positions yeah, to prevent the subluxation as well. The picture on the right side is another, um, is another shoulder sling that we use in our rehab center. It's called give more sling. Yeah, so uh, give more sling, I mean, uh, on the picture uh, illustrating um, that it kind of uh, promote the normal alignment of the shoulder at the same time to provide support yeah, of the hemiplegic shoulder joint. Yeah, by um by the elastic band that uh, hook around the bilateral shoulder, it kind of and um enhance the upright posture as well compared with the uh, normal arm sling, and also prevent uh because in the normal arm sling we always put the arm in the internal rotations and shoulder flexion position uh shoulder flex positions it um we don't want to put these patients into this position to prevent uh flexors uh upper limb spasticity. So the advantage of the uh, give more sting is to uh, prevent um, this from happening. So um, this is the overall summary for um, what we do, what we, uh, what we teach the patient and family members, yeah, or um, anyone uh, to look after them for uh, management of the hemiplegic shoulder pain. Yeah, so essentially, yeah, so um, essentially, either for either for facet shoulder or spastic shoulder, we never pull on the arm. Yeah, when we handle them, get them up from the back, get them to stand, yeah, or get them to walk, never pull on the arm uh, to prevent further damage in the joint. So in dressing, yeah, we will always put the hemi PJ arm into the garment first, yeah, rather the other way around to prevent uh, awkward positioning, yeah, awkward range of motions. Uh, when we do the other way, yeah. In sitting, yeah, we will tend to um use the tray or peel to support, yeah, underneath the arm, either in uh either uh, in those shoulder with high tone or facet shoulder. Yeah, in standing, we will encourage um um people use the arm sling, yeah, for the facet shoulder, but the, for the spastic shoulder, it's not necessary for them to do so. Lastly, I will talk about uh, spastic and um, contractures. Yeah, so it's very common for our stroke patients. Yeah, so even in inpatients, 25% of patients um, will report spasticity yeah, um, within two weeks. In 12 months, it will increase to 38%. Yeah, so it is a uh, severe and disabling. Yeah, and then um, it's um, reported in 15% uh, of our patients. And as we see the stroke patients, we always, we, there's a mixture of spasticity and contractures. Yeah, so both are two distinct issues, but in our stroke patients, it will coexist together and then it will come back on one and another. So here is further to um, get 
us to further understand yeah, the spasticity and contracture. So first, um, after the stroke, they will have a neurological damage. Um, as a result, they will, that there will be a normal sensory motor control and normal motor, uh, muscle tone. Yeah, um, apart from abnormal muscle tone uh, contribute, contributed by the neurological result, um, there will be, con um, because of the lack of mobility, there will be connective tissue adaptation or shortening as well. Yeah, so it will cause muscle shortening or contractures yeah, on top of the spasticity. Yeah, so it's just a, a kind of downward spiral for, uh, for, um, for our stroke patient if we don't manage them uh, properly. So what are the consequences of uh, poor management of um, these matters? So it will cause pain and discomfort, difficulty for them to positions yeah, in different positions. Yeah, they are in high chance of pressure sore or pressure, inj uh, pressure injuries. Because of pain and discomfort, it will disturb their sleep. Yeah, because of the spasticity, it's very hard for them to perform daily ADLs. As we can see some pictures um, in Dr. Khan's presentations, like toileting, personal hygiene, dressing, yeah, um, facing a lot of difficulties. If they're mobile, yeah, um, it will um, get them quite difficult in walking and transfer. If they're having uh, plantar fascia contractures, it may contribute to fall as well. So here are some common patterns of the spasticity. Upper limb tend to be more in the fascia's spasticity patterns, yeah, meaning elbow flexions, shoulder internal rotations, wrist and finger flexions, these are patterns. In lower limb, yeah, in lower limb, um, the most common pattern is more of the um, adapted thigh, yeah, the, the hip, in, uh, hip adductions. Um, the knees tend to flex yeah, during functional mobility. Yeah, the ankle is the most um, worrying um, positions, like they will have a partner flex ankle or ego virus flu or flex toes. Management of it is really a multi -day approach, yeah, involving therapies as well as um, doctors yeah, and other healthcare professionals. Yeah. And we also need to understand what, what's the patient goals or family goals when managing the spasticity. Is it uh, getting them to uh, transfer easier? Is it uh, getting them to um, um, perform their normal ADL easier or personal hygiene easier? Or is it um, to improve their mobility like walking or transfer? So today I will talk about two, um, some, um, some managements yeah, to uh, manage or prevent it, uh, namely positioning and orthosis. So positioning yeah, so, um, is to normalize the alignment yeah, in different positions, and name, namely uh, supine sitting or nine positions. It will help to reduce the abdominal muscle tone and then reduce the risk of permanent disability yeah, and then when they are in a proper positions, either in sitting or stand, uh, in sitting on supine or lying down, you will have a better chance to get them to use their hands, yeah, or um, or head uh, properly. Here is some pictures to illustrate. Yeah, so um, for example, yeah, so uh, we will put. A lot of towers or pillows, yeah, to encourage the normal alignment, yeah, to prevent uh, increased muscle tone, yeah. So put the um put the towel uh put the towel in between uh shoulder and then the uh torso, and then the wrist is slightly uh elbowly then extended, and then the forearm um either put in pronations or in neutral positions, yeah, finger uh comfortably uh open, yeah, with a roll up towel or some uh, squeeze ball, yeah. So the, the, main, uh, the main objective here is to get, um, when we position them, they need to be supported. I mean, the position need to be supported, a balance, and then uh, com uh, comfortable. And then to encourage the symmetry between the, um, um, the long, uh, the long hemi side and the hemi side. Here are some example when they are um, in side line. Yeah, same principle. Yeah, to uh to stop in pillow or tower uh, underneath the shoulder. Yeah, 
and then into um, the wrist and forearm uh, in neutral positions. Yeah, and then the fingers are slightly open and uh, placed uh, comfortably. Here in sitting positions, yeah, same, same principle. Now I'm going to talk about um, the use of um, of horses. Yeah. So in the market, there are a lot of different of horses. Yeah. In the market. Yeah. So namely, again, to reduce the spasticity, at the same time to ma maintain the joint range of motions and prevent and control the contractures as well. Um, we commonly in rehab, yeah, we commonly use uh, the knee gaiter to maintain the knee range and prevent the knee uh, flexors spasticity. Yeah. For the elbow, we have the elbow gaiter. And then uh, we, we will prescribe and get the family member or carer to apply the resting AFO yeah, for those uh, back bound patients or back ridden patients that who, uh, um, who has a tight ankle or who are in risk of um, ankle plantar vessel spasticity, uh, as well as the hand spin as well to maintain the range of motions uh, of the wrist and fingers. So we will also um, uh, educate the patient and family members two hours on and two hours off yeah, to, uh, to prevent, the, uh, to maintain the skin integrity and to uh, encourage the circulations. Yeah. So things to take notes yeah, or consider when uh, putting on um, the orthosis. So we need to ensure the uh, skin is clean and moisturized yeah, and dry before putting on yeah, um, the orthosis. And then we uh, we do not strap the offices too tightly. Yeah, if not, we will kind of cut out the circulations yeah, of the affected area. Um, after donning on and down of the offices, yeah, we really need to check the skin, yeah, in terms of if there's any uh, skin breakdown or redness or rashes over the area, especially over the um, bony um, prominence like our ankle, our elbow, and our knees. I think that's all yeah, of my um, talk today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you, Simon, and thank you, uh, King He. So uh, we have got a few more minutes. Uh, I think Q&A is important for us to have some uh, deepening of our understanding of the topic today. Uh, please uh, type in some, uh, if you have any questions, please type onto the Q&A function of the Zoom uh, um, yeah, uh, online. Um, so for a start, actually, um, in the community, you know, working among seniors, we have, usually we don't have a person with just purely a stroke condition. They tend to have high blood pressure, diabetes. Some of them may even have dementia, even um, Parkinson's uh, kidney problems. So how, um, maybe i like to ask Dr. Kong, uh, how do you assess for rehabilitation potential? Generally, are there any... Um, a rule of thumb that you could advise uh, community doctors, nurses, like whom should we encourage strongly that they should go for active rehab and for whom we should perhaps just um, be happy with maintenance kind of exercise and function? Yeah, I think that's, I, I, I thought this question would come up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's an important question. I, I think uh, so, so. So let me, uh, I think uh, uh, I just... Uh, Refer to what Simon said in his speech, you know, uh, earlier on when he gave the, the, the a graph on prognosis on pattern of recovery when yeah. it recovers. So I think that's important. Uh, I think uh, time after stroke is really a very important factor. Yeah. If, you're, if, the, if your client or patient is one year after the stroke, you mm -hmm. know, and they've gone through some form of rehabilitation, whether it's intensive or not, it's not very likely that we're going to get much more neurological recovery. You need to have neurological re recovery to functional recovery. You can mm -hmm. have functional recovery without neurological recovery. But of course, you have greater functional recovery than good neurological recovery. So mm -hmm. one year after a stroke, you know, you would have almost assumed that 99% of your neurological have taken place. So then ask yourself, okay, uh, how much more can we push? If that push is to, is, is a very important milestone, like getting patients to walk, versus not walking, then I think it's worth doing itself, right? Mm. So the factors then determine that will be, I think, of course, patient's motivation, right? Mission's motivation is very important itself. And of course, we always need the medically stable and, and family support self. <laughs> so, mm. so the stroke survivor cannot do himself, everything is for itself. So, so family support is important. And of course, also financial considerations also, and patient's own goals, I think. So the first thing itself is to see whether there's further grounds for for further neurological improvement. If you see a patient three months, I'll be more I'll be happy to work with him than somebody's one year, actually. Yes. You know? 
And and yeah, I so I think that's that's the thing itself. And motivation is very important. I think most mm-hmm. and, and and family support. I think that's the two biggest factors. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. That's a very clear answer. Thanks, uh, Dr. Kong. I have a question for Simon. I know there's a question online uh, that is directed to King He, but I'd like to ask Simon one question. You know, sometimes we have clients who are deconditioned and maybe they've got stroke. And uh, when do we refer to the physiotherapist? And when do we just perhaps consider a lower cost uh, alternative like an exercise therapist or just giving them some exercise um, uh, um, advice and they can do the exercise at home. So the role of physiotherapists in maintenance rehab and when do you do what? Simon. Mm, yeah, yeah, thanks for your questions. Yeah, so um, I mean, this is a good questions, especially in a community when we are alone seeing a patient. Yeah, so when to do what? Yeah, so um, I mean, the main, um, I mean, the main, um, concern here is more of the uh, main consideration is to um, see um, what, what, what is the, uh, what's the goals, yeah, what's the goals of the patients, yeah, the goals is essentials, yeah, and then also uh, we need to see um, the history of the patients, uh, whether, whether this patient has uh, undergone any uh, rehab, what's the previous functions like, yeah, what's the previous uh, functions before we take mm-hmm. over, yeah, or uh, we are uh, um, we um, see these patients, yeah. So, like for example, uh, um, when uh, before uh, before we see these patients, maybe the patient has already been um, walking well, yeah, in the community, maybe attending some uh, day uh, daycare or uh, day rehab centers, yeah. For um, I mean, for those uh, maintenance we have or we have, yeah, so to speak, yeah. Then when we gather the history, then now when we see the patient in our face, maybe there's some uh. Uh, difference in terms of what they are describing before, maybe there will be functional decline and stuff. Then in this case, yeah, so I think uh, the role of the piece is important, yeah, to really uh, step in and then to uh, input to uh, kind of to rehab them to the previous functions. Let's say, for example, maybe um, they um, they have already been in um, in a, a similar functional status for a very long time. I think gener- a generic the generic exercise or advice will be sufficient. Mm. Yes. Thank you, Simon. We have two questions from the audience and I think they're directed at uh, Dr. Kong. The first one is on the medicine for spasticity, tizanidine. I've not heard of this one. Another one is uh, um, on chemo denervation after three months and six months and one year. So Dr. Kong, please. Uh, tizanidine, uh, tizanidine is actually a uh, uh, medication that's been around for more than 10 years uh, and it's been shown to be effective for treatment of spastic and stroke. That's an RCT, actually. It's just that we don't have this medication in Tantosin Hospital. I know Singapore General Hospital has this medication to design it in. Effectiveness is probably about the same as speclofen. It can still mm-hmm. cause drowsiness, weakness. So the side effects are fairly similar. Uh-huh. Uh, this is my own personal view. For stroke, because most stroke patients, the spastic is focal spasticity. So when the spastic is focal, we should use focal treatment. That is uh-huh. really, the focal treatment is really chemo innovation. Mm. Uh, it's not always good to use a medicine which has systemic effects and side effects for somebody to focus spasticity unless the patient has got generalized spasticity yeah. albeit sometimes it may be useful so I'm not a big fan of oral medications for patients with stroke for patients with spinal cord injury for those with more diffuse spasticity brain injury yes certainly and most patients are elderly as well and all these medications have got central side effects of the patient's cognition as well so I'm, I'm a bit more hesitant yeah the second question is chemo denivation as to whether they need to repeat. So uh, if you if we give use button toxin, button toxin lasts for two or three months. If it's in a chronic case of spasticity, it's a very good chance that you probably need to repeat that, especially if used for the upper limb. For the lower limb, like I showed my video, so sometimes the, the reduction of the spasticity, for example, plantar flexion allows patients to stretch the ankle, reduce the co- concomitant contraction, and they may not need to have repeat injections. Or if they do need to repeat injections, it can be drawn for more than three months, can be six months. For the use of a nerve block with fetal alcohol, really it really depends on how much concentration. So I have cases where I use 100% alcohol and I'm able to localize the nerve very exactly. Now this ultrasound, we can be spot on with the nerve. In the past, we just need a stimulator. And if you just do one and six months, one year, you don't need to come back. Mm. Yeah. So for me, sometimes about weighing cost, cost benefit ratio. And if the patient is willing to accept this potential small risk of this anesthesia or neuropathic pain, 
I'll do it to them. Yeah. Uh, if, if they can afford it, I'll offer bottom toxin for them. And sometimes I combine both because bottom toxin itself, there is a limit as to how much you can inject. So if a stroke patient, if upper and lower limb specific severe ones, I need to inject both. You find that the recommended uh, maximum dose of 400 units of Botox is not good enough. Then I may combine the block like a muscular cutis block to block the elbow flexors and reserve the Botox for the smaller muscles. So it's fairly flexible actually. But at the end of the day, whatever you do, there must be a goal and the goal must be with the patients. You know? So sometimes patients come with Botox thinking that once the tone goes down, they can improve function. <laughs> it's not the case. And, and they... And, and they become disappointed. So we must be very clear. And I absolutely agree with what Simon says. We have about goal setting, uh, clear goals between ourselves and the patients. And just to add on to what, what Simon said earlier on himself, in a chronic case, I think that's a big conundrum for us rep physicians you know, because we know that they've reached their neuro plateau. Functionally, they're maintaining. Sometimes it's very hard for them to keep doing that for the rest of their life. So some degree of, 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 of physical deconditioning happens naturally because they grow older also. Yeah. And because they spend 80% of the time in a non-walking state, that, de that, 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 that accelerated aging is much faster mm -hmm. than us. And yet, how do we motivate them to do that? Do the same thing again, which can be very monotonous to them. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the challenge for the stroke career to survive itself is, number one, if they can do something. Number two, trying to make what they do different and interesting yeah. to them. Yes. That would be useful. It's something that to do. And then the challenge I find a lot itself is treating patients with, you know, stroke is very simple for me. It's either you, you have recover upper limb use or recover lower limb use. <laughs> lower limb is a mobility, right? Mm -hmm. Upper limb is use. And then, then I have a big problem with patients who come with uh, residual upper limb weakness, not a stroke, and they want to improve upper limb use. And we know for sure that they can't, mm -hmm. you know, and yet they go for day rehab center and they do have upper limb stretching at sizes to itself. And yet that's not really make them recover a lot, really. You know, mm -hmm. so sometimes it's having a, a hard to hot talk the patients. You know, some patients I know will not be willing to listen to what I say mm -hmm. in terms of the eventual prognosis, but some patients are probably willing to understand that given the limit of time that we have for each patient, you know, whether it's done by exercise physiotherapists, by exercise kinesiologists, or by helper itself, you know, what is the best buck for your investment in time and effort itself? Mm -hmm. You know, hand if you lose, if, if you if you lose if you can recover up, you still have good arm to do so. And most of the patients, if they have a severe upper limb impairment, even though they train the impact uplink, you find it in the daily ADLs, they only use to go arm to do things only. <laughs> yeah, because there's learned this use. Whereas walking wise, you have to use both legs to walk. Yeah. You know? So I feel that the investment for stroke patients, anything else, mobility. Yes. If you can walk, it makes a difference in terms of care, in terms of the physical status, in terms of everything else. I'd rather put the investment in the mobility actually. Thank you so much, King. Here, I think that's um that's very sound advice. The focus on what is meaningful rehabilitation and also what is realistic, uh, and focus on mobility. Um, we have two more questions. Let's make them the last one. Um, there's one. Um, just now we've been talking about motor function loss, but this is related to sensory loss and the persistent numbness. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, it can happen you know after even one year after post stroke. And so, what do you think are the potential for spontaneous recovery? So both. King here and perhaps Simon could also address this. And the last question, perhaps we can also just ask here, is about the role of acupun acupuncture <laughs> or spots and pain. So maybe King yeah, he? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I answered acupuncture question huh. first. Okay. <laughs> Again, a comedy. <laughs> I myself I'm practicing acupuncture actually. So, huh. so 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 I always tell them that there's no good evidence that acupuncture facilitates motor recovery. Oh. It does not make you recover faster if you have concomitant rehab. But it doesn't mean there's no for acupuncture. A lot of stroke patients have got pain, aches and pains, you know, and this acupuncture is useful. And sometimes acupuncture can also be useful for alleviation of mood, promotion, promote, promoting sleep, even constipation, things like that. For me, the questions I ask is, 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 is the patient's uh, belief in acupuncture. Mm -hmm. If the patient's carry strong belief, please go ahead itself because it's extremely safe, you know. Yeah. I would probably tell you if you're on blood feed, warfarin, anticoagulation, or the NUEX, please be more careful itself. You know, mm -hmm. otherwise, please go ahead. Most acupuncture patients will find some relief of some sort. Mm -hmm. But if you hope that that can recover, motor recovery, then probably not the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Possible works anyway, right? So, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So, about the numbness and uh, persistent numbness tingling, maybe uh, Simon, you have any thoughts about loss of sensor, um, sensory function? Mm -hmm. any? Yeah. So, yeah, so sensory uh sensory recovery, I think similar to the chacha tree for the motor recovery. Yeah, so um sensory recovery um is um I mean tend to um tend to um 
peak around three to six months times after stroke. Yeah, after that, they will, uh, uh, I mean, the recovery curve will plateau off. Yeah, so in one year post stroke, yeah, if the patient is still having um, um, impaired sensations or absent sensations, um, most likely they will be in that stage. Yeah, so a lot of patients will complain maybe older sensation as well, tinglings, yeah, um, numbness, and uh, and so forth and so forth. Yeah, so um, that, um I mean, uh, certainly it will affect um how they perform in their daily life because uh, imagine they cannot really feel it will really affecting their balance when they are walking around, uh, affecting how they uh use their opening. Uh, more importantly, I would like to highlight is more of the um, to be paying uh, any um, secondary complications because their arm or their leg cannot really feel well, especially when they um, when they have a lot of comorbidity like uh, diabetes and stuff like that. Yeah, in the first place, yeah, they they are not really uh, feeling so well now on top of the stroke with the sensory impairment. Um, if they uh, if they hit, I mean, if they hurt themselves accidentally or hit themselves accidentally, you know, I mean, um. Uh, make things worse. Yeah, if their arm is not in a proper position, they, um, I mean, they kind of forget their arm because they cannot feel. Yeah, you're also damaging their joint and show, especially the shoulder as well. Yeah, the key point uh, is to uh, have a um, uh, increase the patient awareness. Yeah, uh, how to uh, uh, I mean, um, the reduced sensations or sensory loss. What's the consequences and what to look out for? Yeah. Yeah, when uh doing their daily life, maybe checking uh maybe checking checking their skin uh, uh regularly. Yeah, be, be mindful on their knee positions. Yeah, and stuff like that. Maybe exactly. I'll just add two points to this, shall I? Uh, yeah, please. The first itself is uh, numbness. Yeah, so a lot of time the numbness is due to the stroke, but in sometimes there can be secondary causes of numbness, especially if numbness is in, in a particular area, for example, in the hand itself. Then we need to exclude common causes like carpal tunnel syndrome mm. because they have that a lot because of swelling edema. And if they use a walking stick and they upset the pressure on, on, the, on, on the other mm -hmm. side itself, then the good hand, you can get that. So on the bad hand, you get swelling. And, and carpal tunnel syndrome uh, 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 is a simple, simple, simple thing to treat itself. So sometimes we cannot assume that it's always due to the stroke. You have mm. to look for secondary causes. The second itself, sometimes patients the problem numbness with complaints of very uncomfortable um, feeling, uncomfortable, uncomfortable tightness or tingling sensation. Uh, uh, and, and we call that post stroke central pain. Uh, you know, can happen itself. Normally happens about three to six months after the stroke, not acutely because of how our brains rewire after the injury yeah. itself. And some of these patients they complain very tight feelings, very, very uncomfortable. And for such cases, then maybe, you know, if, if necessary, some centrally acting medications like gabapentin and brigabaline can be useful for these patients. Yeah, thanks. Perhaps can we just take one last question because um, it was asked earlier, maybe it was not fully answered about chemo denervation um, after one year of stroke. Is it effective? Yes, yes, yes. But where, you know, whether it's bottom toxin, whether it's bottom, it doesn't matter when you do it itself. You mm -hmm. know, so long as the patient has got spasticity, so long as hypertonia and it's affecting the patient's function. Uh, mm. It can be done. In fact, most spastic happens in a chronic state, partly, partly because of prolonged ability to spastic plus on associated contracture. So, irrespective of duration post stroke, if there is indication, it can be done, not issue. So, we just uh, follow on to the same question, right? So, is that benefit of uh, uh, reducing spasticity even without a, pos uh, a functional improvement? So, because after like one year, you're not expecting any more uh, improvement in the motor function, but there's a lot of spasticity. Is there a, a benefit or a purpose to refer them uh, to get treated for the spasticity itself? Yes, certainly, certainly. Uh, uh, so, for, so, so, if, so after one year, for example, you have a patient with shoulder adductor, elbow flexor spasticity, very severe. You know, sometimes it's so severe that they have associate contractures and they're not able to put on the upper limb dressing. They have pain when they try to put on their, their, up, their, 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 their shirts and things like that. Then it's worth doing itself. Similarly, same for those with lower limb spasticity. They can have knee flexion contracture itself, knee flexion spasticity, even though that does not allow them to walk itself. But reducing knee flexion contracture spasticity itself, it may allow them to sit properly and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it can be achieved. So a lot of goals sometimes is, is for us to help the patients to define what the patients may not see as a goal, sometimes after explaining to them, they say, yeah, I know this is useful. For example, because my flexion, knee flexion contracture, I can't sit up. 
if the if the potential to sit up is a goal, then it's worth looking at itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been such an educational and beneficial afternoon having both of you here with us. So for me, my take home is really the important factors for rehab potential is motivation, psychosocial support, as well as the neuropathology. It has got its time, time um, yeah. trajectory, so within the first yeah. year. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, I hope our audience could help us improve our webinars by participating in our to give your feedback. You know, the link is with you on the chat group. And uh, yeah, maybe Christina, would you like to close the session? Yes, thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Kong and uh, Simon for a very, very comprehensive and uh, useful talk that we will try to remember and apply in our work. <laughs> and also, uh, we are looking forward to our subsequent sessions also with the Tan Tok Sing's uh, rehab department. Uh, so the first week of every month, we will be looking forward to this CME session. And uh, for the rest of the audience, I, I'm, I'm quite sure you, you find this beneficial. And please do join us at our uh, conference on the end of life care on the 11th of November. Okay, so when you see all the Lazada advertisements popping up, remember to come for the conference. It's just half a day. And I hope you will uh, also find it very beneficial. Thank you, everyone, for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, King. He thinks, uh, thanks, uh, Simon. Yeah, we can take a yeah, thank you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. It was really good. <laughs>